Good evening, ladies, as well as gentlemen. Papa Boris here with the fourth round of the Mage Knight Lost Legion session report. This was the third game of the first league of the board game geek Mage Knight Lost Legion play by forum area. We were playing Dungeon Lords with the Envy and Pity and the Mana Seal variants. Ah, boy, I get tired of saying that, but here we go. It was round four, it was the Knight, Knight 2. First to pick tactics was Tovac, and then Wolfhawk, Goldix, and myself. Let's do a quick recap before we do the tactic selections. Going into the second day, Goldix was in the lead, but he lost that lead by allowing me to get Fireball, which he could have presented, which made me take this tomb, and then allowed me to take out the spawning ground, and then even a Rampaging Dragon for good measure. So I got a ton of fame, and I was in the lead at this point, both fame-wise, as you can see, and also just on a technical level. I was, I was ahead here, just card quality and so forth. Goldix was in second place by fame, by a significant margin, and also just in posi in terms of his position. Um, he was a little bit out of place for doing anything this night, but just the quality of the stuff he had put him ahead of Wolfhawk, who was in third. And then Tobak was just bringing up the rear, unfortunately, just wasn't able to get much going this game. And uh, the second day, he pretty much just took out this tomb and this tower and, and called it a day. Due to the Envy and Pity variant, I did end up taking a wound. Luckily, I was Arithia with Invocation and Healing Ritual, so the wound, you know, in my deck wouldn't uh, have hurt me as much as it would have hurt pretty much anyone else in this game. So, looking at the offer was actually pretty important because I was near, you know, this refugee camp, and what we had was actually kind of interesting. I mean, the silver units, who cares, but we had the white heroes, and then fire mages again, and sorcerers, which are one of my favorite level 3 units. I like them almost as much as I like the catapults. I like the fact that uh, you can, you know, pay mana to block an enemy's resistances, which is sometimes better than the sor than the catapults, just higher elemental attack. The sorcerers also have uh, elemental resistance, which is handy in some cases as well. So, pretty good units. Both of them are recruitable at a monastery, which is significant, because if I wanted to, I could dip down to this monastery, rather than going up to this mage tower, or um, going up here to this luscious area with the swamp dragon, a mage tower, and a labyrinth. So, um, that was it. I think uh, all the commentary that needs to be said. Let's go ahead and do tactic selection. So, first up was Tobak, and he perhaps predictably grabbed Preparation, allowing him to take a card of his choice from his deck. Now, the reason I say predictably is that Tobak really, really, really needed to um, get Wings of Wind. He is stuck out here with nothing to do, but if he can get over to this blue tile, the blue city, he can, uh, you know, there's a monastery here, there's a tomb, there's this tile over here to explore. Remember that when the um, core tiles run out, you can keep exploring as long as the tile you're exploring touches three other tiles, in which case when you explore, you get a random countryside tile from the deck. That actually ended up being pretty significant, as we shall see. Um, next up was Goldix. Goldix didn't dick around, he just grabbed Form the Dusk to make sure that he could get... Uh, the more turns than anyone else. Wolfhawk was up next. She grabbed Long Night, so um, probably that wasn't going to trigger, but uh, basically this ensured that she was going to go second. So I had some options here. Midna Meditation is a choice. Mana Search I definitely didn't want because I had built up quite the army of crystals. My hand, as you can see, was very interesting. I just was ready to burn some shit to the ground with these spells and my rage. Wound, kind of unfortunate, but to be expected given that I had so many wounds in my deck. So what I decided to do here is just grab Sparing Power. Looking long term, I figured there was a decent chance I was actually going to make it up to this Labyrinth. Um, in the third round, I didn't need to go crazy or anything. I was in a pretty big lead, so I figured as long as I, you know, could just keep it um, and be in the same position I was in when the night started, I would be in good shape. But that Labyrinth, if I could take that out, that would pretty much secure my victory if my victory was in question. So I figured let's get the Sparing Power and angle in to take that Labyrinth later on. Okay, so the turn order then was, let's put that over here, Goldix, then Wolfhawk, then Tovac, and then me. Now, oh god, okay, now I will not be narrating the sparing power, um, so just know that at some point in the night I flipped it and got a bunch of extra cards, we'll see what those cards were. Let's go ahead and return these to my main man, Volcare, and start the festivities. So Goldix was up first, playing as he did from the dusk. And his play was as follows. He played March, plus the Familiars. Oh yeah, we need to actually pay our Familiars here, don't we? Goldix put a red crystal on his Familiars, because that's the crystal that he had most of. 
I actually um, had two white crystals, so I put a white crystal on them. Like I've said before, the white crystal is probably the best to put on the familiars because it well it gives you an option of two different things, and movement is very, very good anyways. So anyway, I put, uh, he had a red crystal-based familiars. He spent them for movement, which, because he didn't have a white crystal on them, I gave him only three. Then he actually played regeneration to ready his familiars, and then spend them again. So this is a pretty weak use of the familiars. Uh, he was, you know, pushing for a little bit here. This gave him 2, plus 3 is 5, plus 3 again is 8 movement, which is enough to go 2, 5, 8 to the tomb over here. This is a move I was not thrilled with. I don't know what I was really expecting Goldix to do, but I was hoping for him to go further away from me. And then he spent the Illusionists for a White Crystal. Okay, so now he went into the tomb. He was taking a big risk here, some bad things could have definitely happened, although with both ice dragons gone, you know, he could pretty much take the wounds and kill just about anything. He found a high dragon, which is decent. It does mean that he took four wounds, but the plus side for him is that uh, this thing doesn't have physical resistance, so he was able to just deal nine damage to kill it. The way that he killed it was by playing Rage, powered by a crystal for four attack. He then played Swiftness, powered by one of the white dice, for three more attack. This is a total of seven attack now. He had Freezing Power for a clutch one attack, and that was it. So actually, note that this um, this this Swiftness it wasn't he wasn't paying the advanced effect of Swiftness. He was actually using Universal Power to make this attack four. So he had four plus four is eight, and then Freezing Power gave the clutch ninth attack and killed off this dragon without him having to spend any more cards. So the dragon went bye bye, and he took out a tomb. Um, he flipped Potion Making to heal up two of his wounds, although this did leave two wounds in his hand. And he chose Whirlwind as his spell. He also, of course, took an artifact for his troubles. Now I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> <coughs> ah, excuse me. So this spell offer is pretty crap. Tremor can be good if you're like in gigantic fights or something. Mana Claim, I think, is just trash. And then Whirlwind is like a worse version of Wings of Night. I think the spell is really, really bad. But there wasn't much for him to take here, so he grabbed Whirlwind. It was replaced by Underground Travel, which isn't my favorite spell in the world, but at least it's better than any of the other three that were out there, so that was good to see, because with this Wizard Tower here, I might end up taking a spell at some point in the night. And let's make sure that we give him his fame. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine fame for Goldix, and a shield on the tomb. I actually gave him a level up, so now he had armor of four, which if he had had that before the fight, he would have only taken three wounds instead of four and the potential of getting a new unit. Okay, so that was it for that. Let's go ahead and uh, clean up here. This was quite the big turn. We're gonna discard the Rage, the Swiftness, the Regeneration, the March, keep the Whirlwind, and then the white die that he used got rerolled to gold, so we wasted no time at all here, having a craptacular source. Okay, that was it for Goldix. Next up was Wolfhawk. Wolfhawk had uh, played slowly, throughout this game, but this was a pretty big turn for her. She played Diamond Ring to get a white crystal and a white token. She then used the white token to power up mana draw, and with this, she actually set one of the gold dice blue. Now, it was interesting that she chose to set a gold die blue. I think, I mean, not that it matters that much at this point in the game, but I think she should probably have set one of the, uh, she should have set like the white die or the the green die blue. And the reason I say that is simply that um, she's got a lot of crystals here, so improving the source by changing a gold die benefited her much less than it benefited someone like, say, Tovac, who, and or Goldix, you know, who just didn't have as many crystals as she did. So I think uh, being generous here was not what she, sh what she should have been doing. In any case, this did give her two blue crystals, or sorry, two blue tokens. <laughs> that would have been a pretty strong effect if Mana Draw gave you crystals. She used... Swift re Reflexes, powered by the white die that was left, um, to reduce the attack by two of this Lava Dragon that she was engaging. So now it had an attack of four. So that means that she needed block eight not to not take any damage. Well, she actually achieved this. She spent the Guardsman for block four, and then she played Determination, powered by a blue token, for block five. That gave her enough block to be able to block this dragon's attack. 
So, with the dragon blocked, she of course had to kill it. Luckily for her, lava dragons don't have physical resistance, so this wasn't too bad. She played rage, powered, uh, unpowered by, powered by nothing, plus march with wolf's howl. So this was giving her here um, a total of five attack. No, sorry, four attack plus two attack, and then two more attack from Deadly Aim, which is a really good skill, gave her eight on the nose, and then that allowed her to kill this dragon. So she got eight fame, finally leveling up to level six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and excuse me, Wolfhawk should actually have an extra level token. So she actually, um, with the Wolf's Howl, had a bonus one here. So it was five attack, plus two attack is seven, plus the Deadly Aim got her up to nine. So in any case, she did that, and she killed the dragon, and it also gave her two reputation, because that was a marauding dragon, putting her back up to zero, which is convenient. She then, uh, after combat, played Crystallize, powered by the other blue token for mana draw to gain a green crystal, so she's just swimming in mana here, veritably. And that was a level up. So her choices for the level up were Motivation and Refreshing Bath, which are both pretty bad skills, not that that's surprising, because Wolfhawk skills are just all bad, so she put these back into the offer, both of them got sent to the common offer, and she took a good character skill to see our menu of options here. We didn't really have the greatest source, a lot of this was mana skills, which Wolfhawk didn't need, shield mastery is alright, but here it wasn't going to be that great, we had some motivations, um, movement wasn't that great, because she was on this, you know, blue tile, didn't need to move around very much. She, however, took Burning Power, a skill that I was very loath to pass way back in the first night, but I think it was the correct move to let it go in favor of Healing Ritual. So Wolfhawk passed, uh, picked it up here, which was much to her delight that it was there, as opposed to something junkier that could have been there in its stead. In any case, she needed now to um, collect an advanced action. She took Heroic Tail because that was the bottom one, and when you're picking another hero's skill, of course, you don't get your choice of advanced action, you just take the bottom one. We got Shield Bash here, which is a piece of crap, and uh, I think that was it. I think we did everything that we needed to do, so let's go ahead and clean on up, and no, Heroic Tail, you're still here. Oh, wait, 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 we gotta give her a fame for that diamond ring. Yeah, don't forget that. Okay, so, let's discard all these cards. Do, 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 do. This music is brought to you by Papa Boris. Do, 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 do. Okay, here we go. Um, the white die re-rolled to green. Man, when people have active turns, this is really... It takes a long time to clean up. So notice if Wolfhawk, instead of um, turning this gold die blue, it turned like one of these green dice blue, the source would be uh, just short one green die. So that would be like one less green mana for all of her opponents. And uh, that would have helped her considering how, much, how many crystals she had. She didn't really need the source. So in any case, that was that. And next up was Tobak. So Tobak predictably uh, played Wings of Wind. He did not have any more white di mana in the source. Both white dice had been used by Goldix and Wolfhawk. Uh, luckily for him, he had three white crystals. So that allowed him to spend movement points to fly over terrain, which is an incredibly good ability. He played Swiftness plus Rage for three movement, and with that he went floop into the monastery. There he actually had more to do. He played Threaten, and he discarded Mana Draw sideways with his no reputation penalty. He was doing fine on that, hanging out at the zero edge. That gave him three influence, and in fact, he just picked up some Herbalist. I thought he was going to heal himself, but no, he got this unit here. So now he actually had a source of green mana, which is potentially useful for him if, if, if he needed to, like, you know, draw two cards with Tranquility or heal two with Tranquility or something like that. So, um, Wolfhawk actually was very annoyed by this, I'm sure, because she was probably hoping to have all this to herself, so having Tobak here was a bit of a pain. Okay, now it was up to me. So, here I had some options here. You can, if you wish, pause the video and think about what you would do under these circumstances. Okay, so, one obvious move would be to go up to the refugee camp. This had several advantages. One, I could recruit units. Two, I was, you know, going in the direction I ultimately wanted to go. But... I worked out the math and found that if I recruited monastery units from this ref refugee camp, I'll put this up here if you don't know what this is. Um, where does it say refugee camp? Oh my god, oh there it is. So, anytime you recruit, a, you can recruit any kind of unit that you want here, but if it's a unit that can't be recruited in a village, you have to pay extra influence. So for monastery keep and tower units, you have to pay 
an extra one influence if that unit can't also be recruited in, in a village, of course. So here, um, we had gotten Fire Mages and Sorcerers, both of which would cost an extra one influence. And I could recruit all of both of them at this refugee camp if I dumped my entire hand. However, I didn't want to dump Mana Bolt and Fireball. I was okay with dumping Flame Wall because it's pretty crappy and Rage, which is fine. But I did not want to dump these two things because that would be like pretty much all my attacking power out of my deck. And I probably wouldn't be able to get rid of the, the Labyrinth. So basically, I thought my choices were either to go here and recruit one of the units, not the other. Or I could dip down to this monastery and recruit both units. I decided to go down to the monastery and recruit both units. I figured it was worth the risk of Goldix attacking me because um, Pavel could have attacked me perhaps and dealt, dealt a lot of damage. But I doubted that he would do this because that would cost a lot of resources. He wouldn't know what I had and whether or not I'd be able to like put up a good blocking fight. And in any case, he could wound me a lot, but then I would just, you know, spend a turn resting, discard the wounds, and, like, where would he be? So, I took a little risk here, although perhaps that was a risk I didn't need to take. I should have just probably moved over here, contented myself with one of the elite units, and then moved on up, stayed away from, from Goldix. I guess one thing is that I knew that Goldix was holding on to two wounds, so I knew that his attacking potential would be sort of limited. So maybe that was what tilted me over to the edge of actually going down here. So in any case, I went down there, and then I, I decided to interact. So the way I got here was I played Ray, Scouts for two movements and Rage for the third movement to go down to the desert. And then I actually exploded the Bag of Gold for nine influence and three fame. So explode, boo, nine influence and three fame. I then spent the Familiars for five influence, flipped the Banner of Courage to ready them, and spent them for five more influence. This is 19 influence, and then I played Flame Wall for another influence sideways, so that's 20 influence. So, if you look at the fame, thanks to my killing the Rampaging Dragon last round, I was at minus two instead of minus five, which is a big difference, because 20 minus two was 18, and 18 was just enough to recruit the Fire Mages and the Sorcerers. Now, because I wasn't level nine, I couldn't uh, actually have room for them both in my inventory, or my command, whatever. So I had to actually kick out the scouts. Goodbye, scouts. Boo! They're gone. Now, that's actually a pretty good end for the scouts. They were deposited at this, you know, juicy desert monastery. Um, I seem to have this trend of recruiting scouts early on, and like having them get bitterly wounded and dumping them off in the middle of nowhere. This game, scouts ended up, you know, doing pretty well for themselves. I don't think they were wounded a single time. Good for me. So we need to make sure that, of course, we get the fame here from that bag of gold. One, two, three. And it was not without a little nervousness that I waited to see what Goldix would do since, um, you know, he was coming up next. Now, you might wonder why didn't I healing ritual to get rid of this wound? In my last video, I made a really big deal about how you should do that instead of waiting for the second wound. Well, the thing is that um, here I had invocation, whereas previously I did not. So having invocation, I actually wanted to hang on to this. I might need it for the red mana um, under certain circumstances. Also, if I drew a second wound, of course, it would be great for me to be able to, um, you know, flip, throw away both wounds to healing ritual. But if I decided to burn this monastery, being able to get red mana could be important because I only did have, like, this red crystal here. Granted, I had the uh, dark fire magic skill, but with the fire mages having a red mana skill and the catapults having a red mana skill, and then me having a fireball, which might need red mana, and mana bolt, which might need red mana. I actually needed a lot of red mana, and I figured, you know, let's just be safe and keep this wound here. In retrospect, given how the round played out, probably should have just flipped Healing Ritual and gotten rid of this. I had a lot of cards in my deck, so it would be nice to make sure, and I was going last, so it'd be nice to, you know, make sure I got through my whole deck. Well, in any case, whether that was a mistake or not, I didn't actually manage to use any dice from the source, so it was Goldix's turn with the source unchanged. He played a pretty simple turn, he just discarded his determination and rested. So these got discarded, not healed, and he was still holding on to his whirlwind, and that was that. Next up was Wolfhawk. Wolfhawk, um, contrary to her previous game, was starting to do quite a lot of stuff every turn. So she played Offering, powered by a red crystal, and that gave her a red crystal back. She then discarded Mist Form and March to gain a blue crystal and a green crystal. So that makes sense. She wasn't really going to need a lot of movement here. She was pretty content to be on this tile, at least for the next little while. Then she played Concentration, powered by a green die, on top of Heroic Tail, which she already had previously. Uh, okay, there we go. 
Um, for a total of eight influence, and then plus one in fame and plus one reputation for each unit that she recruited this turn. She did, in fact, here um, have enough to recruit the white heroes uh, by spending the blue heroes. So the eight fame plus the influence from the blue heroes gave her enough to recruit the white heroes, which was the last elite unit available in the offer. And note that she had some extra reputation. She had one extra reputation from the shield in the blue city. The, the blue city is considered to be conquered with one shield from everybody. So that was actually a bonus influence and a bonus hand size for her. And this is significant because she actually uh, spent the white heroes now and had just enough influence when combined with a blue crystal to purchase a spell from the blue city. And here she decided to pick up a mana claim. Now, that was actually very fortunate for me because the best spell here was underground travel. But again, Wolfhawk was in this place where she wasn't really going to be doing much traveling. So underground travel, while, the, while being the best spell in the offer, wasn't really all that great. That said, mana claim, I think, is just junk. So in any case, that was very fortunate for me because I got to see another spell come in. It was Call to Arms, which was a very good spell. So that was exciting. Okay, so anyway, that was her turn. Let's make sure that we give her what she needs. She got one fame from Heroic Tale and three reputation, two from spending two heroes, and then one from Heroic Tale. So she actually got a reputation bonus. The green die that she used got rerolled white. So there was again white mana in the source and a decent bit of variety. Okay, let's play the end music. Okay, there we go. Next up was Tovac. So Tovac I just was a mess here. I didn't clean up any of his crap. Jesus, Boris. Watch yourself before you clutch yourself. I'm not sure how that really ends. Okay, so he played Book of Wisdom and trashed Tranquility. Book of Wisdom, of course, lets you trash a card to get an advanced action of the same color from the offer. There were two good green things here. And he elected to take Force of Nature, which again makes sense. Pathfinding is probably the best card that was in the offer, but he didn't need to move anything. He just needed to be able to fight. And the next card coming in was Peaceful Moment, which is all right, but, you know, nothing super spectacular. So then he played Crystallize, powered by this lingering blue die that Wolfhawk had left for us in the source, to collect a green crystal, understandably, for Force of Nature and the Herbalists and all that good stuff. And uh, that was it. So the blue die got rerolled green, so the source got a little bit worse there. And that was that. Next up was me. So here, I could have burned the monastery pretty easily, of course. But Goldix had rested, so now there was a chance that, you know, he would just decide to attack me because maybe attacking me would be better than trying to do anything else. So I decided to leave the monastery to him and just go my own way. My new hand was actually pretty good. I drew some movement, which I had been hoping for, stamina and march, so that was great. I played concentration for a blue token. I used that blue token to power stamina for four movement, and then I also played march. So this gave me a total of six movement. I was able to go boopity boopity. I actually went here, not to the refugee camp, because I didn't want to recruit any more units, but here. So if I wanted to, like if I got a bad hand or something, I could decide to go over to this monastery. And I engaged the Swamp Dragon. So I figured, you know, I've got this fireball here for combat. I don't necessarily need to save mana bolts for killing dragons. Certainly it'd be nice, and fireball doesn't kill every dragon. But I figured, um, let's just go ahead and use this mana bolt up. I was a little bit concerned about Wolfhawk playing Mind Steel. So I figured, let's get the black die out of the source here. So if no one rerolls black, she won't be able to play dark spells. And um, just, you know, use that mana bolt, because that was uh, a pretty efficient way of getting this dragon to die. So I actually let the familiars who had been spent get damaged twice. Um, the, s the familiars with their five armor are handy for absorbing a swamp dragon's attack. To kill it, the swamp dragon, I played mana bolt with a blue crystal, a red crystal, and a black die, which is actually mana thunderbolt for a cold fire attack 10, which just with one card killed off the dragon. Now I decided not to discard the wound for invocation, and I decided not to heal it with healing ritual, which again was probably a mistake. Remember that in the Dungeon Lord scenario, after all the tombs are conquered, and all the dungeons are conquered, the game ends. So Dungeon Lords is a five round scenario, but if we conquered everything in this round, the game would be over. So um, 
there was a chance that I actually wouldn't get to see my whole deck, so now I was shorting myself two cards by not having healed up this wound in the first round of the night with Healing Ritual. I would have seen two more cards out of my deck, kind of healed this up. But granted, they could have been wounds, but um, I think probably holding onto this wound was a little bit greedy. In any case, that died. I got seven fame. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and two reputation, which was nice. And a level up. So my skill choice, there really weren't many skills I wanted from my own stack, and polarization and dark influence were certainly not among the ones I wanted. I'm actually not sure if there was anything I would have taken at all here. Hot swordsmanship, maybe? Oh, wow, yeah. I, what am I talking about? I would have taken either of these. So yeah, this was a really bad skill draw. Not that I can complain about bad luck this game, but these are definitely the two worst skills. Polarization is a great skill. This is a tremendous skill. But... I don't need it now, I'm doing fine with mana, with invocation, and dark fire magic. That would be way too many mana skills. Hot swordsmanship would be nice for giving me some insurance against dragons, and power of pain, of course, would let me spend my wounds for, for valuable stuff, which would help me out. So, yeah, that was unfortunate that I didn't draw either of those. But it's okay, because Wolfhawk did give something to this offer that I wanted. I wanted Refreshing Bath. Normally, not a great skill, but I did have exactly one wound. And I could get a blue crystal, which might help me out at some point. So perhaps that is also why I didn't um, use up this wound. I was, I was figuring, you know, if I drew a wound, I could healing ritual to heal both. If I didn't draw a wound, I could refreshing bath just to heal the one. The black die, oh crap, I did not mark down what that black die turned into. So we're going to say that it turned into a blue die, because I think that, that that's what it was, although I don't know. In any case, uh, we can go ahead and discard my stuff. And that's it. Oh, yeah, I need to take a card from the offer. <laughs> right, so I needed movement. I took Pathfinding. That was going to be a great help to, to going north in that tile. So these crappy skills got moved down, and we got Stout Resolve, which is all right. It's, it's not terrible. I mean, you can't really say it's terrible. It's like an instinct, a green instinct, but better. But it's just never anything I'm super excited about. But it was there. So that was that for my turn. And we were back around the horn to Goldix. So Goldix played Threaten, powered by a blue die. So aha, the black did roll blue. Using universal power for three movement. He did move to the monastery here since I left it behind. And he went ahead and he burned the bitch. He played Horn of Wrath to kill what was inside. Horn of Wrath plus freezing power will kill just about anything. Except for, like, the familiars. It wasn't the familiars, it was the monks. So, Goldix lost 1, 2, 3 reputation. He gained 1, 2, 3, 4 fame for killing the monks. And he did not get a wound from Horn of Wrath. There's a 1 in 3 chance of getting a wound. It did not happen. So, that was fine for him. And then, yeah, we were, we were good to go here. Boop, boop. The blue die stayed blue. Bop. Still didn't use Whirlwind, because guess what? Whirlwind sucks. Next up was Wolfhawk. So Wolfhawk played Tirelessness for two movement and an extra movement if she played another card for movement, which she did. She played Rage. And with Intimidate sideways, she moved to the two. Now, I gotta give Wolfhawk some balls points. Uh, using Rage and Intimidate for movement to move to a tomb is pretty crazy because you think you might want these in the tomb, but I guess she just didn't have anything better. And then she played Mana Claim, which she'd been holding on to, powered by this conveniently located blue die, to um, steal a white die. So this was not the advanced effect, because I, I hadn't left any black mana in the source. It was just the basic effect. But she now had this white die, so every turn she'd have a white mana token from this die, and the rest of us didn't have that die there anymore. The blue die conveniently did turn red, so we had a little bit of something-something in the source. And that was that. So finally everything got used up. And she was sitting on the tomb. So if she conquered it successfully the following turn, the game would end. The game end would trigger, even though we were around short of finishing. And then everybody, including Wolfhawk, would have one more turn before the game ended. However, well, we'll see what happened. So Tovak went into the monastery. He burninated the countryside. And he found the illusionists defending the treasure that was... Oh, hold on a minute. This is Wolfhawk. This is not Tovac. <clears throat> Tovac. He went to the monastery, found the illusionists. He did have a pretty good kill for them. He played Concentration with one of the innumerable green dice on top of Force of Nature. Wait, oh, God. Where did Force of Nature go? What the... Didn't we give Tovac Force of... Oh, my God. I gave it to somebody else, didn't I? Gave it to somebody else. 
Who has Force of Nature? Oh, shoot. Did I lose? For I lost Force of Nature, guys. I just lost it. It was there, and then it wasn't there anymore. Um, I put it in the discard. Right, because he got it, and I discarded it for absolutely no reason. Okay, great. So we play Concentration, powered by a green die onto Force of Nature for five Siege attack. And then with another two from the Knight Sharpshooting, he was able to break through the physical resistance of the Illusionists and kill them. For this, he did collect some fame. One, two, three, four, finally getting up to level five and increasing his hand size. Um, and then he also lost three reputation, one, two, three, for burning the monastery. So that was good, he got an artifact, which I'm sure he was very excited about, and the green die re-rolled to gold, which I don't know if anyone was excited about that, but that's what happened. Next up, it was me, let me clean up the correct cards this time. Do, 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 do. There, bonk. Next up was me. So here was my hand. I had a six card hand. I did draw the other wound, but uh, with catapults and fire mages and fireball, even with this wound stuff, I was more than capable of taking out pretty much anything that this tower could throw at me. There was one unit left that would have been bad. That would have been the ice mages uh, because they have an armor of six. So the catapults wouldn't have killed them. So had I found them, I'm not sure what I would have done, but I probably would have just taken taken two wounds, and then I could have healed up three of the wounds. Um, in fact, I could have actually invoked to use a wound as red mana to power fireball, and then um, I could have like healed up two with healing ritual and one with refreshing breath. So I could have ended up with no wounds, but you know it would have been better not to take any wounds at all. In any case, I, it was worth going in because I was guaranteed to take out that tower. I played Pathfinding, powered by a green die, and normally that would have gotten me here, but note that Pathfinding reduces terrain to a minimum of two, so these planes have two terrain, but because of the wall it's increased to plus one. So it kind of sucks the way that works, but then I had to play chill for an extra point of movement to actually be able to reach this tower. So camping out here in this tower was not Ice Mages, it was Fire Mages, which made all the world of difference. So all I had to do the, to kill these was to just use my catapults for five blue siege attack. Awesome possum. Um, I just used a blue crystal there, and that did the job. So this gave me minus one reputation for assaulting the tower, and one, two, three, four, five fame for killing the fire mages. I got to take a spell, and here the um, choice was kind of an interesting one. So, Call to Arms probably is the best spell here, but if you look, there's nothing more to recruit. I don't want either of these things. So, I took Underground Tribal because I thought that, you know, that could be handy for moving somewhere else. Restoration is just utter trash. Maybe I can go back to this monastery later on and burn it or something like that. Or just, you know, interact there and heal some wounds. My green die turned blue, so by moving and acting, I actually improved the source. The next person, Goldex, would have quite a field day with this. And after combat, I uh, flipped Refreshing Bath to begging your pardon. I did not flip Refreshing Bath because I had two wounds. Right, my plan was if I had two wounds, I would flip Healing Ritual. So I healed up one of the wounds, and then the other wound I gave to my man, Goldix, who took three wounds from me over the course of this game, the poor guy. So that was it for me. Let's go ahead and clean up here. Pathfinding was spent. Underground Travel was acquired. Swiftness was not spent. Chill spent and the catapults were spent okay there it is back around to goldix so goldix conquered a tomb moved to a monastery um burned the monastery let's give him his credit here Bing. what was he gonna do next well the game was probably gonna end next turn because wolfhawk was gonna conquer this tomb and triggered the game end but what goldix did was he actually played energy flow powered by a green die, not for its effect of refreshing the familiars, but actually with universal power for four movement. And then he played diplomacy sideways for another point of movement. With five movement, he moved here and he explored. And then he found a secret dungeon here. He put the secret dungeon, predictably perhaps, on the plains. So now if Wolfhawk conquered this tomb, the game would not be over because we had found a new dungeon. So it would no longer be the case that all the dungeons and tombs were conquered. So I would have really been happy for the game to end 
because I was going to win if it ended. But now that the game was prolonged, there was a chance that people would, you know, get enough ahead of me that they would win. So I was kind of annoyed about this. I was hoping not for him not to find any villages or monasteries, but he did. So the game was going to be prolonged. He then moved forward, inching along with mana draw and uh, his terrible spell Whirlwind, which isn't even worth playing, just to move over to the village. This would put him in position to plunder it and then go over to the dungeon and conquer him his next turn. He actually played a uh, Golden Grail, an artifact he had picked up from the monastery, for some healing. He trashed the wound that I had given him, and for this he got a fame. So this last wound I gave him, it was actually a benefit to him, otherwise Golden Grail wouldn't have done anything for him at all. So that was cool. And then the green die that he used, of course, went gold. So the source inched closer to being crappy dappy. So bink, 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 bink. Bink. Up next was Wolfhawk. So she did go into the tomb, holding her breath. Clearly with deadly aim and burning power, this is quite a lot of ranged attack for free. Well, it's two, but it's two free ranged attack, one of which is elemental, um, if she wants it to be. So she was really hoping for something she could kill. And inside the tomb she found a high dragon, which was the ideal thing for her. It's worth nine fame, maximum fame, and no physical resistance. So she was able to kill it by playing Swift Bolt and Swiftness. She used Swift Bolt with her mana claim die, and then Swiftness with one of her many white crystals. This was seven ranged attack, and look how good these skills are. That was two more, so that's nine total ranged attack, and there we go. So she conquered a tomb for tons of fame and glory. This gave her nine fame, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So she was actually starting to catch up to Goldix. Goldix was starting to slip a little bit. And it gave her a spell and an artifact and a level up token. So she had better armor now. And for her reward here, she actually chose Call to Arms because the others were just totally useless. Demolish came up next, which just wasn't any better. And the artifact that she got, well, we'll see. We'll see what that was. So the mana claimed die stayed with her. These cards were spent. And that was it. She didn't actually use any dice from the source, so Tovac was up next. Here we saw what Tovac's artifact was. It was a sapphire ring, gave him a blue crystal, a blue token. And let's just go ahead and give it to him now. Eek, one fame. With the... Stam with the token, he powered up stamina for four movement and explored. Now, normally you don't want to explore for your opponent, but here he just didn't have anything to do unless he wanted to pay eight movement to go to this monastery, which isn't, you know, super duper great. So he explored and actually found a tomb. Oh, crap. So um, let me actually put out these guys. So now the game was going to be even more prolonged because this monastery meant that there was a secret tomb. There's only one place to put it because tombs can't go in swamps, which is right there. So there's a secret tomb now, and that means this dungeon and this tomb would need to be conquered for the game to end. And if nobody decided to conquer them, we'd actually go into a fifth round. So I was getting a little bit agitated because I just wanted this to be over, not because I don't like playing Mage Knight, of course, but because I wanted to win. In any case, uh, he actually played Instinct here, powered by the red die, and he had two movement left over, so that's a total of six movement. It costs seven to move to the plains in the forest, and he did provide that seventh movement by discarding Promise. So he staked his claim on the tomb. Pretty good odds he'd get to take it, because it was unlikely that Wolfhawk would actually want to fight him for the tomb. That would be a terrific use of resources. So that was that. Did Tobak ever burn this monastery? He did, didn't he? That rascal. Yeah, let's go ahead and give him a shield token. Beak. Okay, so Wolfhawk was very annoyed here. Tobak stole this monastery from her, and then he also stole the tomb. And there was also these dumb prowlers in the way that she obviously didn't want to fight. So that was a bit annoying for her. So for me, I figured there was a decent chance the game would end. Because Goldix was almost certainly going to do this dungeon and Tobak was going to take out this tomb. Now Tobak didn't have any units. He did have a snowstorm that might help him out. There was a chance he would draw a dragon he couldn't kill. But I figured, you know what, let's just go ahead and uh, flip sparing power. So my hand was this. Which isn't terrible, but I need a lot of movement to go into this labyrinth. It's going to be three to move in there, and I really wanted to do another four to go down the spell path. So let's, I decided to just do sparing power right now, so that I could get more movement. My sparing power was a little bit crappy. For this, let me just expand this so you can see my whole hand. So I got um, improvisation, a wound, 
and Swift. I had like one wound left in the deck and a bunch of cards. I, it sucks that I got the wound. But at least I got some movement that I could use and I availed myself of it right away. So I played Improvisation and Threaten for three movement. With this, I marched over to the Labyrinth. Let's go ahead and uh, put a shield on this wizard tower I conquered. Then I went uh, into the middle maze path with two swiftnesses. So I was planning on um, kill, and I took the sorcerers with me. So I had here fireball, battle versatility, and sorcerers, which is pretty good because I could actually activate the sorcerers. I had white mana and green mana, so I could actually get rid of something with fortifications if I got like a lava dragon. And I could also get rid of their resistances with the green mana, which could be helpful if I got, say, like a fire dragon um, or a lava dragon. It'd be nice to be able to just use the fireball against them. So I was pretty safe going into it. The monster that I actually found here, oh, the monster I really didn't want to find was a storm dragon because that would be only seven mana and it would take a lot of damage to kill it. Sorcerers don't really work very well against storm dragons. They'll block the attack. But they don't like, you know, give you a whole bunch of bonus damage by knocking out a resistance or anything. And storm dragons are only seven mana. I didn't find a storm dragon though. What I found though was the second worst dragon, a swamp dragon. This is annoying because it just is only seven fame, and I had a lot more potential than that. I at this point played fireball. Oh, excuse me. Before I go, I went to the labyrinth. I should mention I actually flipped the fire mages for a red crystal and a red token. I figured I was not going to have a chance to use them this night for combat, so I just took the mana. I used the red token to power up my fireball for five ranged attack. I spent the sorcerers for three ranged attack, and then I played battle versatility. Good old battle versatility. Such a freaking awesome basic card. Um, one ranged attack. So this was five plus three is eight, plus one is nine. Boom, dead storm dragon. So I got seven fame for this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I got to take a spell and an advanced action as well. So I decided to grab Stout Resolve, because that could be helpful in the future. And I also took, um, what did I actually take here? I took, I took Tremor, it didn't matter, this is all, this is all junk. Maybe I should have taken rest Restoration, because I could actually heal with it. Yeah, I think I kept my options open, taking Tremor, like maybe I'd actually use it, but that was a mistake, I think. I should have just taken this Tremor. Or, excuse me, this restoration, because I can heal up some stuff. Hmm, interesting that I noticed that mistake just now. So, um, after combat, I flipped Refreshing Bath to get a blue crystal and heal up one, but not the other, of my wounds. Alright, so it's a pretty, pretty busy turn there. Let's discard all my cards. I did keep a wound. I had the Tremor, Stout Resolve... A wound. Still had fire magic available. And then I drew two more cards, which was my other wound, and a stamina. Okay, so that was it for my turn. We went back around the horn to Goldix. Goldix, as I predicted, plundered the village, losing our reputation, and then decided to take up the dungeon. He did have ambush, which made it way easier to kill than usual, because of course that not only moved him there, but gave him plus one to attack, meaning that he'd get plus one to any ranged attack. He would play here. And after finding the Hydra there, he dispatched it very easily. He had the classic combo, Wolf Focus plus Swiftness, powered by a green crystal, because the source was out of mana. Hang on, well, we lost an extra die here. Where's that? I don't know where the die is, but it wasn't green, so this was a bajillion cadillion with, you know, the ambush and the freezing power, bajillion cadillion range damage. Hydra died. Goldex took one, two, three, four, five fame and an artifact of his choosing. Now let's go ahead and put a shield there, take that token off, boink, and that was that. We went back up to Wolfhawk. So she played Mana Storm. So I actually do need to find out where that die is. Oh god, okay. Where's that? There it is. So Tobax die when you Powered up instinct went from red to gold. But it doesn't matter because Wolfhawk played Mana Storm. She used the Mana Claim token to do this. And then rerolled everything. It rolled as follows blue, blue, red, white, and black. Now, one thing to remember is that when you play Mana Storm, it's actually good to get gold and black because part of the effect of Mana Storm is that it allows you to use black and gold mana as though it were mana of any basic color. 
She hadn't actually used her die from the source. This is the die from mana claim being used. So she could actually use her regular die from the source plus three other dice. So she could use four of these five dice if she wished. So she played Call to Arms, the strong effect, using the conveniently created white dice and black dice. With this, she was able to recruit the thugs, whom she had just recently obtained space for. Then she played Stamina, powered by a blue die, to move east, provoking the Prowlers, whom she killed with Ice Bolt and the other blue die, for a rather humble two fame and one reputation. Okay, that was it. So the blue die, one of them stayed blue. One of them, the, well, the black die stayed its color as well, it stayed black. The white die turned red and the blue die turned green. And then this white die was mana claim, so it stayed hers. Okay, so she was ready to burn this monastery in all likelihood. Tobak was up next, so here we all held our breath, because if Tobak successfully conquered this tomb, then the game would end. However, if Tobak failed to conquer the tomb, we would keep on going. Oh man, I just never like to clean up Tobak's hand for some reason. I don't know why. Boop, 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 boop. He went to the tomb, down he went, and here he found a storm dragon, which is what I didn't want to see, but which he did, because he did have dodge and weave. So he used dodge and weave powered by one of his white crystals to reduce this storm dragon's attack to zero, which counts as blocking it, which lowered its armor to seven, and then of course dodge and weave gives you two attack if you don't take any wounds. So with a single card, he not only blocked this creature, but dealt the equivalent of nine damage to it. It's a pretty good card to use against storm dragons. And then um, he played Rage, powered by the newly appeared red dice, uh, one of the newly appeared red dice for four attack, plus the two that he had from already from Dodge and Weave, plus two from Night, Sharp, Night Sharpshooting, that actually killed this dragon. Four, six, seven. He also decided for some reason to discard Cure and uh, do that. Did I not count correctly? Two plus four is six, plus two is eight. Yeah, he had to kill it, but he discarded Cure just for poops and giggles, I guess, to kill this thing. And um, that gave him seven fame. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not quite enough to get a level up. And possession of the tomb. So, eek, ock. That was his. And he got a spell and an artifact. The artifact will never know. But the spell he chose was demolish. It didn't really matter. He was unlikely to be able to use any of these spells. I guess he wasn't holding on to any wounds for restoration. And we got Exposed, which is a terrific spell. It's always been one of the best spells in the game, but it didn't matter at this point, because you know what, we only had one turn left apiece. The red die rolled gold, and it was up to me, and it was actually my last turn of the game. So I actually got fewer turns than everybody else this round, because I went last, and I think it was worth it, because the sparing power helped me tremendously in conquering this labyrinth. So let's put a shield on the spell path. What was I to do? Well, with this hand, um, pretty clearly my best option was to go to this monastery and heal up. So drawing the wound was bad because it meant that maybe if I had drawn something better I could have burned the monastery. But it was good because it gave me the wound in my hand to heal. So I played Stamina, powered by Invocation, for a blue token. I used... No, sorry, what am I talking about? Jeez, that made no sense. I discarded stamina to invocation to get a green token. I used that green token to power underground travel for the ability to move three revealed spaces other than lakes and swamps. I went over boop boop burrow 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 to the monastery and lacking now the wherewithal to burn it I interacted there. I played stout resolve powered by a green die which was actually here and I discarded tremor to it for a total of five influence. Now miraculously I'd actually killed enough rampaging dragons that I managed to work my way up to negative one. So five influence minus one put me at four, which allowed me to heal these two wounds. And miraculously enough, I actually ended the game wound free. The green die rolled white, and that was my last turn of the game. I actually flipped dark fire magic, which I hadn't needed to get a red crystal, which didn't matter, and a black token, which also didn't matter. So not the most epic final turn of the game, but it would be good enough.
Next up was Goldix. So, with his last turn, what was there for him to do? Well, quite a lot, actually. He played Learning, powered by a blue die for three movement. And then he played March to move on to this Ruin. Now, you might notice he could have played Learning with a white die for four movement, but since his other card that he was playing was March, it didn't matter. He then actually decided to fight these bitches. And he fought two green enemies. One of them was War Beasts, one of them was Trackers, which was not a pretty, which was not a terribly bad draw. He played Fire Mages for the block effect. Six fire block. He did have to pay a crystal for this privilege, but that was fine. So he blocked the Trackers, and then that reduced their armor to three. He then played um, shoving your units out in front of you like a freaking coward to absorb the damage of the War Beasts. So they have six damage here, because it's three doubled. Familiars took five of it. The remaining one was actually absorbed by these illusionists. Um, this is something to keep in mind. Their two armor physical resistance might seem a little bit puzzling at first. Like, well, there's nothing in this game except for, like, golems that only hits for two. So how would that ever matter? Well, it does matter if you have other units to absorb some of the damage. The illusionists can just, like, suck up the rest. That's a uh, very, very common use of the illusionists and is quite effective in some cases, like this one, for example. It saved Goldix two points this game by not having to take a wound. Okay, so that was how the damage was taken care of. So he had five armor and three armor to deal with. He just combined them all into one for a total of eight armor to deal with. He played Chivalry, powered by his last crystal, for four attack and some bonuses. Burning, uh, excuse me, Freezing Power gave him one attack. So he needed three more attack. Well, he got that with Rage for two and his newly acquired artifact from the dungeon, Banner of Fear. Normally a powerhouse, but here kind of irrelevant. Sideways for one more, and that killed these guys. Each of them gave him three fame. So Goldix got one, two, three, four, five, six fame, and a crystal of each color. He also got an advanced action, but it didn't, and a skill, but it didn't matter because he wasn't going to get to use them because that was his last turn of the game. So that was that. Um, did I not say to discard this thing? There we go. All right, so that was Goldix's last turn. Next was Wolfhawk's last turn of the game. So Wolfhawk obviously was just gonna burn this monastery. She had only one card left in her deck, which was Promise, so she played Tranquility in order to draw it. And when I say that Wolfhawk was gonna burn the monastery, what I meant was she's definitely not gonna burn the monastery. She played Promise powered by the Mana Claim die for 4 influence. She played her newly acquired artifact, which was actually Druidic Staff, discarding a red card, which allowed her to ready a level unit 3 or lower. And since the heroes are level 3, she, re she re readied one of her heroes, spent them for some more influence. So she had 4 influence, plus 5 was 9 influence. And she also played Threaten, powered by a red die. For another 5 influence, they gave her 14 influence. She spent the thugs for 3 more influence, so that gave her 17 influence. And then she also had a reputation bonus and mind, mind read slash mind steal, which I'd been afraid of the whole night, but thankfully, which was near the bottom of her deck. That actually could have screwed me up if she'd made me like discard fireball or something, but luckily she didn't have it. So with all this influence, she was able to buy the 3 advanced actions of the monastery. I won't put them over here because it doesn't actually matter. And the red die stayed red, and that was that. So next up was Tovak. Tovak didn't have anything special to do. He just didn't have enough movement to get over here. He probably had the attack power, but even going down the um, basic path, to get down to this maze, he would have needed four, seven, nine movement. It's just more than he could handle. So he played March and Demolish for um, a, a few movement here. I guess, did he, I guess he spent the herbalists, I think, for a token to power march and then demolish for five movement, so that little move to the glade. At the glade, he played an endless gem pouch, getting a couple of crystals. He rolled a gold and a green, doesn't really matter. And then he trashed a wound to the glade, finding his turn there, and that was the game. So I'm not going to go through all the scoring stuff. I'll just narrate how it all ended. After the point soup was over, I had 130-some points, so I did pretty well. 
Goldix had like 108. Wolfhawk made it up to 105, and Tobak was down in the back somewhere. So Wolfhawk almost actually caught up to Goldix for second place. Him conquering that rune at the end of the game wasn't just a cool move, that was clutch. Because if he hadn't been able to get that much fame, like he going into this was like, you know, let's see, 3, 6, 8, 9. He was like 6 fame behind Wolfhawk going into that, so he really needed, needed a big score to catch back up. So it was very important for him to get it. I think Wolfhawk uh, made a brilliant play in the previous round where she got mist form and then she used that to float over the lake into the blue city and put herself into position for greatness but Tobak interfered by stealing this monastery from her that probably screwed her up to the point where she would have gotten second place if uh gold if, if Tobak hadn't done that but um she wouldn't have won the game so it wasn't too bad in the end of the day so that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Please like the video and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to support me and help me out. If you'd like to stick around and uh, hear a little bit more chatting from me about the game, basically, I think that the most significant moment of the game for me was when I conquered this tower in Night 2. If I hadn't gotten Fire Mages, which were just about the best thing I could have seen there, I actually could have just ended up losing. With that said, um, if I hadn't started the night with a terrible opening hand, and if I hadn't drawn like a really bad unit here that was in a minority odds chance of happening, and if the source had not been mana stormed to have no white, no green, and no black dice, which prevented me from killing the summoner that was sitting here, then I wouldn't have needed to take that risk. So I got, you know, really, really, really unlucky, and then I got a little bit lucky. So I think it all kind of balanced out. Uh, I think my worst play was not uh, preventing Wolfhawk from stealing my Ice Bolt. That was a huge mistake. I really should have. I had like three different ways I could have prevented her from stealing Ice Bolt with Mind Steel, and I managed to do none of them. I also didn't use my familiars quite right in the th second day. I spent them for movement in this maze, which wasn't smart, and I spent them for movement from this hill to this spawning ground, which wasn't smart either. So I did make a few misplays in this game, but I think I played pretty well overall apart from that. I think the most significant moment of the game that wasn't me, but in my opponent's hands, was Goldix letting me take the right moment in the second day, instead of forcing me to go ahead of everybody and get stumped by the mana seal that was still on level five. So I think if he'd actually taken the perfect, uh, if he'd taken the right moment, I think he would have won this game. I'll just go ahead and make that prediction. You, uh, I'm curious to see what you guys think in the comments below if you have any opinions on that. But that's that's my belief. This game would have been been won by the dragon if he had taken the right tactic. So it was a very close game. It wasn't just a matter of like you know me snowballing out of control and not having any chance of anybody to catch up. I think it was definitely a game where a lot of people, um, Wolfhawk maybe even, were in the running just if they had made different choices. So, pretty cool game. I don't want to ever play with Envy and Pity and Mana Seals because they're idiotic variants. I wouldn't recommend using them. Hopefully seeing them here was enough to discourage you from ever using them in your own games. Uh, and that's it. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you again soon with some more Mage Knight videos. Take care, everybody.